الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمد كثيرا وطيبا مباركا فيه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة كل ضلالة في النار Usually I don't begin by thanking people because there's never enough time with all the information that I want to get through. But I'm going to take this opportunity out to thank everybody who has something to do with me coming here, taking advantage of this opportunity to come to another masjid that has been converted from a place that used to make a shirk billah azza wa jal to a place where the people are making the tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's tremendous ni'mah. And every time I find myself in places like this, my chest, my spirit, it um, is uplifted. So we want to thank all the brothers that had something to do with this opportunity. Sheikh Suhaib, as well as my brother Shiraz, the administration here, any and everybody, those people who are the unsung heroes even who are behind the scenes that people don't know what they're doing, but Eliza just knows. Today's lecture has been entitled The Whispers of the Enemy or something to that effect, The Whispers, The Whiswas of a Shaitan. And in reality, when I was speaking to the brother and he wanted to give me an idea of the topic that he wanted presented to the community, then it has to do with a lot of things that are going on. One of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah, according to what the Nabi said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is when he told the people, Tunzi'u, uqulu akthari dhalika zhaman. As Yom Al-Qiyamah gets closer and closer and closer, the intellect, the minds of the majority of the people are going to be taken away. And what prompted that statement was he told the people close to Yom Al-Qiyamah there will be haraj. They said, what is haraj, Ya Rasulullah? He said, indiscriminate killing. People will be killing one another. They said, why is that strange? As a community, Muslims were given dawah, they said back then, and we killed so many non-Muslims during the course of the year because we're spreading Islam, they opposed the dawah. Not because Islam spread by the sword, but we're calling Allah's creation, the companion said, may Allah be pleased with them, to Al-Islam. And those people are opposing Al-Islam, so we have battles, like the battle of Badr, like the battle of Uhud, like the battle of Beni Mustalaq, and on and on and on. They said, why is that strange? He said, I'm not talking about you Muslims killing non-Muslims. He said, I'm talking about Muslims killing one another where you will find a man who kills his father, he kills his cousin, he kills his neighbor. So the companions upon here that they say, Ya Rasulullah, during that time will the people have their uqul, the intellect? He said, the hadith. Tunzi'u uqulu akthari dhalik zaman Most of the people who live in during that time their intellects will be taken away. So when we talk about the wiswas of a shaitan, there are many other issues that can be touched upon in terms of the widespread of mental health challenges. Bipolar, schizophrenia, extreme bouts of depression, anxiety, wiswas, wiswas to the degree where a person is tied up and wrapped up like a pretzel stand in front of the wash basin for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, not sure whether or not they will do as being accepted and so forth and so on. Wallahi, I'm not here to put anybody down like that. Even this guy, Kanye West, 
I think many of the young people have heard of his situation. I'm not one of those people who is quick to just dismiss him and just say, oh, he's crazy because he has bipolar. I don't think that's the way we should deal with people like that. To just dismiss someone and say, oh, he's crazy. Because that's not how El Islam deals with that. Islam takes in consideration that this stuff is real. And there are things that we can do to make it easier, to make it better. And there are even things we can do to take it away, to make the izala of the mushkila. So in our audience, you'll be surprised to know that in front of you, to the right of you, left of you, behind you, there are people who suffer from all kinds of issues. And from them is the wiswas. And I think the lies were jealous because one of my family members used to have wiswas. So I know the problem from up close and personal, how you can watch the person make wudu and no matter what you say, no matter what you say, they don't think that they read Surah Al-Fatiha correctly. They made a ghusl, no matter what you say. They feel that the water didn't hit a part of the body, no matter what you say. Every time he sees the letter D, like D for drive, when he looks at the D, he believes that he has divorced his wife. So you ask him the question, what about this brother and that brother and that brother who has a car and he sees the letter D? Does it automatically mean that their wives are divorced as well? He said, no, just mine. Wiswas, big mushkira. But we're going to put wiswas as an issue on the side. We want to deal with something else today. Something that is not from, not from the issue of the challenges of people having mental health issues. But it's something that is really dangerous and critical in Islam. And it's something that many of us sleep on it and we don't take it seriously. And it is serious as you're gonna see, inshallah. And personally, I believe it should be mentioned at least two, three times uh, from the member. People should be reminded of it. Like the Prophet also mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Signs of Yom al-Qiyamah is that people will not mention the dangers of a Dajjal from the member. People need to hear about the Dajjal constantly. They need to hear about the Dajjal. But when's the last time you heard a khutbah about the Dajjal? If someone gave the khutbah about the Dajjal once every month, twice every month, he would have done us a great service. By not mentioning the, the, the Dajjal and reminding the community, it is a disservice. This issue is like that. And that is the issue of what we have in El Islam concerning what is very harmful, that is called Al Ain, Al Ain, the evil eye, the evil eye. Most of you I don't know. I know a Sheikh Suhail, Suhaib, I know his brother Abdul Samad, I know a few people here by name, by face, most of you I don't know. Just coming here, sitting here, people can afflict me with the evil eye. La Sama Allah. And you can be afflicted with and by the evil eye. And you're a practicing person and you're trying to do the right thing. So it's not an issue that people should remain ignorant about. And we should be like in every issue in the middle. Not too far to the right and not too far to the, to the left. Too far to the right is the one who says, everything is evil eye. No, brother, you didn't crash your car for an example because of the evil eye. You are not a good driver. You were speeding. You weren't paying attention to what you were doing. That's why you crashed your car. Everything is not an evil eye. Your headache, the fact that your nose is bleeding. That's not, everything is not the evil eye. So we don't want to be of those people. Everything is the evil eye. Nor do we want to be of the people. I don't believe in the evil eye. I don't believe in the evil eye because it's not in the Quran. No, that's kedit. The evil eye is in the Quran and it's in the Sunnah. From where it is in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal is in the surah that we all have memorized. Min sharri hasidin idha hasad. I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of the hasid, the one who is envious while he's being envious or while she's being envious. That ayat of the Quran, according to the great mufassirin of the Quran, 
عطاء قتادة وتوبة عبد الله بن عباس may Allah be pleased with him they say the meaning of this ayah I seek refuge in Allah from the evil eye of the one who is envious listen to this hadith of the prophet as it relates to envy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said استعينوا على انجاح هوائجكم بالكتمان فإن من وراء كل نعمة محسود if you want to be successful in the thing that you're trying to do you want to get married you want to buy a house, you want to buy a car you want to get a new, you want to move you're going to have a baby he said if you want to be successful in what you are trying to do then remain quiet and don't talk to people about it because every ni'mah that Allah gave you there's someone who was envious every ni'mah that Allah gave you there's someone envious if you have a nice car, someone has hasid. You can't walk around and say, you, you, you can't do that. But you should know, if you have a brand spanking new baby, there is someone who is hasid. And it could be your relative, it could be your neighbor, it could be someone who knows you, it could be someone who knows you, doesn't even know you. So that ayat is a delil of the evil eye. Also from what the scholars use as a delil from the tafsir of the Quran is the ayat in Surah Yusuf. I don't have time to go through the whole story about Yusuf, but when the brothers of Yusuf came to Egypt and then Yusuf had them to put the cup of the Aziz and the saddle of the youngest brother, Benjamin, the brother that's the Shaqiq of Yusuf, and they found it, they said, we're gonna keep him here. You go back and you have to go and get your father, whatever. When they went to Yaqub and told him the story, he didn't really believe the story, but they were about to come back and he wanted to give them some advice. And the ayat that mentions that is that he said, قَالَ يَا بَنِي لَا تَدْخُلُوا مِنْ بَابٍ وَاحِدًا وَادْخُلُوا مِنْ أَبْوَابٍ مُتَفَرِّقًا وَمَا أُغْنِ عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Oh my sons, when you guys go to Egypt and you're about to enter into the gate of Egypt, all of you should not go into the same door, but you should go in different doors in order to enter into Egypt. And I cannot help you concerning that which Allah has decreed for you. If Allah wants something other than khayr for you, I can't help you. But I'm giving you advice. Scholars said, concerning the tafsir of this ayah, this ayah is about the evil eye. So Yusuf had 11 brothers. He saw the sun and the moon and 11 stars making sajda to him. He had 11 brothers. He made number 12 from his 11 brothers. Abdullah ibn Abbas said that Yusuf's brothers were very handsome, just like Yusuf. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And Yusuf's brothers were not only handsome, but they had physical body prowess. They were strong. So the man who was here who has 11 sons, he has 12, 13 sons. That's not normal from amongst us. He has 7, 8, 9, 10 sons. All of them were strong. If he walked into this door right now, all 10, all 11 his sons came in. Everybody's going to look at him and say, wow, mashallah, that man has 11 sons, 13 sons. They all come into the masjid. There's a sense where people say, wow, it's the wow factor. If you add on to that, they're all muscular. They're all looking good. So the father didn't want them to go through the same door. They get that effect and the impact from the evil eye of the people. That's the second ayat of the book of Allah. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anyone who comes to the masjid and he reads one ayat of the Quran or he learns the meaning of it, or he reads two ayats, or he learns the meaning of it, or he reads three ayats, or he learns the meaning of it, that is better for him than having a red camel. So that's the barakah of coming to the masjid. Two ayat, they prove the evil eye. And then there's the third ayat. And this one is even clearer. 
Allah Ta'ala mentioned many examples of the response of the non-Muslims of Quraysh when the Rasul used to read the Quran, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. لا تسمروا لهذا القرآن وألغوا فيه لعلكم تغلبون. When he used to read the Quran, the non-Muslim Quraysh would say, "Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him when he reads that Quran, and make a lot of noise to distract the people so that you can overpower him." That was one of their responses. Some of them used to put their fingers in their ears and get up and walk away, huffing and puffing. But this ayat of the evil eye shows. The proof of the evil eye. Allah is a firm believer that the soldier that is informed is more effective than the soldier who's not informed. When the general says to the soldiers, hey, hey, just go over there and take that hill. Just go. He doesn't know why. We just go marching over there. We don't know why. But if he explained to us, if we take that hill, then we'll be in a strategic position to make these moves. We'll be more effective knowing what we're doing. So I'm mentioning this to you. Not for any hocus pocus, kala, make you scared, but to say, as he said in the Quran, mankind has been created weak. All of us are weak. Mankind has been created weak. So why have arrogance? Your job, your money, your tribe, your personality, why have arrogance? Submit and be humble and then take precautions to protect yourself from the evil eye. Because wallahi billahi tallahi, this majlis right now of good people, we could give evil eye to one another. Intentionally or unintentionally, it can happen without anybody being able to do anything about it, inshallah. But we're gonna inshallah, mention some things that we can do to put us in a better position to push it off of us. So that's the first issue we want to make. Now the strange thing that I find, especially in 2022, and as a father, as a person who's given dawa, you fathers, you mothers, we have a great responsibility concerning our children. Our children are growing up not knowing that they have to take care of the Islamic identity. The Muslim, he eats with a certain hand, he drinks with a certain hand, he looks a certain way. As soon as you see him, you know there's a Muslim from his name, from what he's doing and how he's doing it. You come for the very first time. You know this man is a Muslim, never met him before. You know she's a Muslim. So the Islamic identity, we have a religious responsibility to protect it, to maintain it. We have young people growing up and they don't even know. If a non-Muslim dies, you can't make dua for that non-Muslim no matter who they are. You can't make sajda for the non-Muslim no matter who they are. We don't even know basic, simple things. I'm not saying that to be condescending, to be one of those people who everything is negative, other, the water is, the cup is half full. I'm not one of those people, I'm a positive person. But we have to state it as it is and let the chips fall the way they may. There's a person from our ummah who doesn't believe in the evil eye. He says, using his intellect, ilmul kalam and his intellect, how, why? Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali, may Allah be pleased, they didn't ask those questions. When Allah Azawajal revealed ayat, ar-Rahman wa ala al-arsh istawa, Abu Bakr and they said, how, why, when? They never said that. When the Prophet told them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in an authentic hadith, al-aynu haq, the evil eye is true. Not a single companion said, how, why, what? They didn't say that. So he doesn't believe that an innocent baby, the baby didn't do anything. He doesn't believe the baby could get evil eye. It's not fair. How, why? I don't believe in the qadr. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a shaitan, when every child is born, the shaitan comes and pokes him in his side, except two human beings, only two. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not one of them. I'm gonna ask very quickly. Who's the first person that the shaitan doesn't poke in the side? Who's the first person, brother? Not you, not you. My man right there with the glasses. Akhi, akhi, yeah. Who's the first person? Who? No. 
Adam never came out of the womb. He never was born. Allah created with his two right hands. Who's the first person, my man? You're not sure? Yeah, he's speaking out of turn, man. Sorry. Isa was the first person. Good job. The second person? Isa is the first one. The second person, Sheikh? No. My man right there. Second person, who is it? All right, pay it up. We, we learn in our religion. The first person is Isa. This distinguished gentleman sitting right here with the glasses and everything. The white looking brother, not Caucasian white, but light skin, you know? Who's the second person? Come on, man, this ship is sinking like the Titanic. Like the Titanic, who's gonna save the boat? This brother right here, right here, right here, yeah. As I'm looking to choose people, people are getting smaller. I can see you, that's gonna make me choose you. Last person, last person, little man. Who's the second person? The two people, Isa and his mother. Isa and his mother. Everybody else, Shaitan came to him and stuck him in his side. And then the baby screamed out. Why would Isa, why would Shaitan stick him in his side? He's innocent. He's bari. He's miskin. Is he believes his way of saying, I'm waging war against you. And I'm gonna destroy you. And I'm gonna make your life jammed up. And the end game for you, if I can help it, is the knot of Jahannam. And I'm gonna let you know that from day one. That's what the Nebi said. Oh, you're gonna reject that too? The Rasulullah told us that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what's this thing about your intellect? Another thing is Ibrahim, Allah Azawajal, cause the fire to become cool for Ibrahim. He said to the fire, be cool for Ibrahim, become easy. Can you imagine the fire is burning? Ibrahim is in the middle of the fire. I don't know if he was sitting down, standing up, but he was just cooling out. And the fire, didn't, the person believes that. He believes that, but he doesn't believe in the evil eye. Although the prophet would take his two grandsons, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Hassan Hussein, and every parent should do this, and he would say to Hassan Hussein, "Ridukuma bi karimatillah atama min kulli shaytan wa hama wa min kulli ain lama." I seek refuge in the perfect words of Allah for you too from being harmed by any evil rodent that's dangerous or poisonous, and from being harmed by the evil eye. He said, Ibrahim used to do that for Ismail and for Yaqub, Ismail and Ishaq. How do you believe Ibrahim was in a fire, but you don't believe this hadith about the evil eye? How? How you don't believe? How do you don't believe in the evil eye you see it as being khurafat when you believe in al-Isra wa mi'raj How what kind of religion is that? The Rasul said al ain haq the evil eye is true. So let me elaborate on that for you brothers very quickly inshallah. Authentic hadith and incident you have to be aware of. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling with his companions on their way to Mecca. While they were going on the road to Mecca, one of the companions, his name is Sahl ibn Hunayf, he was in some water taking and making a ghusl in some water. And his son was there and another companion came. And that other companion, his name is Amir ibn Rabi'a. When he looked at the man and he saw his skin tone and complexion. It was very white. It didn't look like it belonged to a man. It should belong to a man. And that's because the sun of Arabia. If you're out in the sun, you know, like the people here. We have eczema. We have people who have, you know, those bumps from razor bumps. People who, as you get older, if you don't put lotion on and you know, your skin is going to get jammed up because of the environment. 
But this man's skin looked like a virgin girl who didn't come outside. That's what he said. So when Amma walked by, he said, whoa, I have never seen skin like that man's skin, whoa. And upon saying that, the man fell in the water, started drowning. The people rushed to his aid and assistance, pulled him out of the water, and he couldn't keep his head up. He lost consciousness. He was out for the count, and they didn't know what was going on. They hurried him to the Nebi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The son said, Ya Rasulullah, this happened to my father. His name is Abu Umama. My father, he can't, he can't keep his head up. There's something has happened. Can you help him? The prophet said, what happened? What happened is a proof, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not Hazir Nazir. He does not know the ilm al ghaib Anytime you see a hadith where he says, whose camel is this? It's mine, Ya Rasulullah. This camel is complaining that you overwork it and you don't feed it. A dalil, he's not Hazir Nazir. And he doesn't know the ilm al ghaib if people come, he will say, Men al qawm, who are you people? We're from this tribe that it's a Dalil, he's not Hazar Nazar. That is the religion that's not going to help us in the dunya or the akhirah. That's the religion that's going to keep us backwards and confused and keep us out of Allah's divine assistance. What happened to him? He said, Ya Rasulullah, your companion, Amir ibn Rabi'a. He came by and he said such and such, and then he just fell down and this what happened. The companions said that the Nabi looked at the companions. He looked at Amir and he looked at the companion. They said, we never saw him as angry as he was on this day. Why was he angry? Because in El Islam it's not permissible for you to hurt me and for me to hurt you. You can't hurt me and I can't hurt you. And when we meet each other, we say, Assalamu alaikum. That's our way of saying, hey, hey, I'm not going to hurt you. I won't make ghib of you. I won't make namim of you. I won't have su adhan about you and on and on and on. If you marry me to your daughter, I'm going to take care of the amana. I marry you to my sister, you take care of the amana. I sell you something, I'm going to be honest and on and on. That's what it means. So anytime that was compromised, he would get upset. And you know he was a gentle man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why didn't he get mad and upset like that when the Bedouin urinated in the masjid, akramakum Allah, in the masjid in Medina, exposed his aura, akramakum Allah, showed his nakedness in public and urinated. And he told the people, leave him. Gentle, easy. The young boy came and said, Ya Rasulullah, in front of all of the community. Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to make zina. Why? Because he was young, struggling with his desires. He wasn't trying to be a criminal. He did it in public. He knows Rasulullah understand his plight. Give me permission. And the people got upset. He said, hey, take it easy. Come here, young man. Do you want people to do that to your mother, to your sister, to your aunties? He said, I will be that. He said, the people don't want you to do with their family. And then he took the boy and he made dua for the boy. And Allah took that shahwa out of the boy. Why was he gentle with those people? But with this guy, he was upset with this companion. Because, listen to what he said. And what he said to him, he's saying to you, 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 and me and everybody else. He looked at the people and he said, Why does one of you kill your brother? Why does one of you kill your brother? And then he told him, If any of you see something, within your own self, or you see something within your own money, your car, your house, your furniture, your refrigerator. If any one of you see something with your brother that he has, then make dua with barakah for him. Don't say, wow, good job. You're the man, you did the job. Don't say that. 
Say, Barakallahu Feek. Allahumma Barak. They had a baby. Don't say, Wow. You see the baby for the first time? The baby has beautiful hair, nice eyes. You say, Whoa. He said, Don't do that. Why would any of you kill your brother? You're the reason that your brother was killed. So that goes to show that the evil eye is a murderer. It will kill. In an authentic hadith, he mentions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in al ain Tutkhil al Raju al Qabr, wa Tutkhil al Jamil al Qidr. Verily, the evil eye can cause a man to enter into his grave. And it can cause the camel to enter into the pot, the cooking pot. Because someone sees a strong camel or something like that, and he doesn't praise Allah with barakah. As a result of that, the animal falls down and it dies. And then the people have to eat him after that. So the evil eye will kill. Now, a few things I want to share very quickly, Ikhwani, and a lot has to be said and could be said and should be said. This is important. Two people, Shaitan did not touch them. Isa ibn Mari and his mother, you know, something new for some of you. Concerning this hadith of the man Sahl ibn Hunayf, listen to this. This incident goes to show that the evil eye can be given by one who is religious or the one who is irreligious. It could be the one in the first row, on the right side of the first row. It could come from the Imam, from the Hafiz Saab. It can come from the one who wears Jilbab and Niqab, got a beard, so but short. Because that companion, Rabi, that companion, Amir, is from the companions. The evil eye can come from someone intentionally or unintentionally. He didn't mean it. He didn't try to hurt you. That wasn't his intent. There's the shaytana and the shaytan from the ins and the jinn who sit and they want to hurt us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from their evil. Say I mean. But it can be from someone who it was unintentional. He didn't mean that. That Hadith shows the evil eye can come from your relative and from a non-relative. It can come from the person who loves you and the person who's your enemy. The evil eye can come from someone sitting in this room and it can come from someone on the other side of the world. On the other side of the world. It could be in Mirpur. He could be in Mogadishu right now. Brooklyn, New York. How? Abu Sam is going to take a picture of my little baby and I take a picture and I put that picture on social media. I put that picture on TikTok. I put that picture trying to get these views and people looking at my stuff, my wedding, my breakfast, my dinner, this and that. I take a picture of that. People who don't even know me can give me the evil eye on the other side of the world. The evil eye can be done by a jinn that you can't even see, or by a human being. Pay attention to this. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Uqtulu tha tufyatain wal abtar. If you ever see the two snakes, a tufyatain and al and al abtar, kill it upon sight. What are those two snakes? That's the snake that has two lines down his back. If you see it, kill it. And the other one is the snake that has a short tail, the aptar. He said, what's the reason why? What's the illa? What's the hikmah? He said, because these two snakes will cause a woman to lose her baby. There are people who, this hadith is authentic. But Europeans don't believe in it, so he won't believe in it. White people don't believe in it, so he don't believe in it. George Bush, Obama, they don't believe in it, so he doesn't believe in it. Well... We're people who believe in the prophets and the messengers. And they told us a lot of things that the normal person who is a Catholic can't get his head around many things in our religion. So we're going to reject it because they can't get with the program. And that's why he is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. 
Because when the kuffar came to him to try to make him scared of his religion, they tried to blow on him. They want to blow. Some people, when they get that blow, you can't wear hijab here. She said, okay. You can't go to Jumeh. You Okay, you can't pray. Say, okay. Many people are like that. They try to do that to Abu Bakr. Hey, Abu Bakr, did you hear that your man Muhammad last night said that he went to the seven heavens and he came back and he went to Baytul Maqdis in one night? Abu Bakr said, I didn't hear that. Nah, I didn't hear him say that. But if he said that, I believe him because I believe something greater than that. And Isra al-Miraj is a big miracle. It's big. But I believe something greater than that as a miracle. He said, I believe him when he says he gets revelation from the sky. The Quran is a bigger mu'jiza than al-Isra al-Miraj. It's a bigger miracle. When the Prophet heard of that motive, that position, he called him a siddiq the one who really believes. Not wishy-washy. When the winds of adversity come, we want to throw in a towel. She accepted Islam, she's a revert. She gets married to a brother who is not a good example of a Muslim, so she apostates because of him, or vice versa. No. There is a snake that can kill the baby. So we told the people, kill it upon sight. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it relates to this issue of the jinn and his important guys. He says, sitru ma bayna a'yun al-jan wa awraad bani adam idha dakhla ahaduhum al-khala in yaqul bismillah. Pay attention to this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the partition, the hijab, the partition, that exists between the eyes of the jinn that we can't see and the aura of Beni Adam is if any of you goes and you want to go to the toilet to the bathroom you exclude yourself when you take your clothes off if you say bismillah the jinn can't see your stuff you can't see your stuff but as a father Abu Usama Dhahabi I have to be on top of my children with these adhkar. I've been a Muslim since 1986. I don't know the dua of going to sleep yet. As a Muslim since 1986, I don't know the dua to protect myself from the hand. My children, whenever they want to eat, they're so hungry, they just start going in. No, guys, you have to say bismillah. But if you forget, say bismillah, fi awalihi wa akhirihi. So the child is always saying Bismillah fi awalihi wa akhirihi. Because as soon as the, cut, the grub comes, he jumps in and you gotta remind him. No, you have to make it your business and your job to learn these du'as for protection and to pass down to your children the heritage that your parents passed to you. What heritage? You guys were born and raised on Al-Islam and your parents gave you Muslim names like Suhail, Suhaib, Abdul Samad, Bilal, Muhammad, Ahmed, and so forth and so on. That's from the heritage that your parents, maybe they couldn't read and write some of them, maybe they didn't practice Islam very well, some of them, but they gifted you al Islam. You have to do better than them. And part of doing better than them is spending time and making jihad. And I don't bite my tongue for anyone. I'm not hesitant to use that word jihad in this masjid. You have to make jihad against yourself against ignorance. You don't have to memorize all the Quran. You don't have to pray Qiyam al layl all the time. If you do that, alhamdulillah. But you have to do enough to push off of yourself, not knowing. Protect your kids. So as it relates to the issue of the evil eye, evil eye can hit somebody and the individual doesn't even know who it is. It could be fiend or foe. It can be a shaitan وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيًّا عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ زُخْرَ فِي الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا Allah said for every Nabi who came, every Nabi. We made an enemy for that Nabi. An enemy from the jinn. 
an enemy from the human beings. And those jinn and those human beings, they inspire one another with words in order to hurt that, 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 that Nabi. What do you think this situation is with you and me? What do you think that situation is going to be with you and me? Enemies from the jinn and from the human beings. So we have to learn these issues. As it relates to the issue of the evil eye, Ikhwani, the evil eye comes from hasad, envy. The evil eye also comes from an ijab, being impressed with something. And that's normal and natural. Someone pulls up in front of this masjid with a 2023 Bentley. And we look at it, we're going to say, wow, look at that. It's natural, it's normal. It's normal. And he has no evil intent connected to it. Evil eye also comes from jealousy. People were jealous. And as we mentioned, for every single nema that you have, something as simple as you got an extension to your kitchen, there are people envious. Your child graduated, there are people envious. And they can be from your cousins, your aunties, your sisters, your brothers. People who are close to you, plotting and planning. May Allah protect us from the evil of the evildoers. See what I mean? So what can we do? What can we do? There are quite a few things that we can do. Like the Prophet mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he mentioned these hadith in different ways. If any of you sees from his brother, from himself, from his brother, from his money, that which pleases him, then make dua for barakah. You know, there's an ayat in the Quran in Surah al kahf where the two men were arguing with each other and one of them said had you only when you entered into your jannah because the man was saying i got more kids than you i have more money than you my house is better than yours i'm from this side of the dam you from the other side of the dam i'm from this tribe you're from that tribe i'm this color you're that color so Allah destroyed all of what he had. So the one who he was arguing with said, had you only gone into your jannah and you were your garden and you were humble and you said, ma sha Allah, la quwwata illa billah. This is important. The man's jannah, if he would have said about his own garden, what he had, had he said, ma sha Allah, so when you see that Allah has blessed you with something, you got married, your child, you should say, MashaAllah. You should say, MashaAllah, because the ayat is showing you it's his property. But the hadith said, if any of you see something from your brother, then you should make dua for barakah. If you see something from yourself and your money, you make dua for barakah. So for yourself, you say, Barakallah fiya, barakallah, whatever it is, and mashallah for yourself. But for your brother, if you say mashallah, mashallah, you could say that. But it's better to stick to what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now listen guys, this is serious. Doing the weddings, when we go to these weddings, everybody is wearing their nice clothes. Everybody is smelling nice. So someone invites us to the wedding, and I don't know about this city, this place, but in the wedding, there is the place where it's very expensive, it's high end. The bride and the groom, they rent it, all these nice cars, Rolls Royce, 10, 15 of them. The food, you know, unfortunately sometimes, the bride and the groom, young brother, young sister, they walking down, people throwing rice on them, they saying, here comes the bride, here comes the bride. That's not our religion. Throwing rice, singing, here comes the bride, here comes the bride. That stuff is Europe. That's not Islam. So the person goes to the wedding and he says, man, that food was good. Yo, did you see those cars? Oh, man, the place was nice. And without even meaning it, you've given the people their evil eye. They're going to get divorced. They're not going to get along. So what was the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Anytime people got married and he wanted to make a dua for them to newly married people, he would say to them, "Barakallahu alaykuma." 
وبارك الله فيكما وجمع الله بينكما في خير. Hey, you young brother, you young sister, may Allah's baraka be on top of you, be inside of you. May Allah bring you together in good. Bring you together. Why would he make dua for baraka on a day like that? Because people are there being amazed at it. And there's some people who are there, he's divorced. So he's hating on the program. She's divorced, hating on the program. So that's a dua we should learn. And as a person who's getting married and you give those cards and stuff to let people know, maybe you should put that on your card to remind people. So that people unintentionally don't come to the wedding and say, whoa, did you see her dress? Or man, did you see those shoes he had that was curling around like that? You know those shoes I'm talking about? Some of you know those shoes I'm talking about. What are those shoes called? Hossein. You know, the Kose shoes. Yo, did you see them shoes? They were sharp. You have to say, Barakallah, on his Kose. So that he doesn't get the Ain. From what we can do concerning the Ain is, read the Mu'awwadatain, those two surahs that I don't believe there's a single Muslim in this masjid who hasn't memorized them. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq and qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Everybody memorize those surahs. Everybody. But how many times do we read those surahs in a day? Because Rasulullah equipped us to read those surahs constantly after every prayer at nighttime before going to sleep. But some of us barely use them the evil eye is serious brothers the evil eye is serious from what can be done and we're going to stop inshallah in a few minutes is as we mentioned to make al-isti'adha al-isti'adha is when you generally say a'udhu billah al-isti'adha where you seek protection from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he learns that dua to say it on his baby girl say it on his children say it on himself Oh Allah, in me, a'udhu bika min al ain. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. Please protect me from the evil eye. So the different is the others that come to us from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet, like we mentioned some today. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Another very important one. Man qara'a akhira ayatain min surat al baqarah fi laylatan kafatahu. Listen to this hadith. Anyone who reads the last two ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah, those two ayat will be enough for you. So Maghrib comes in, you read those last two ayat. Who doesn't have time for that? Whoever reads those last two ayat. Amen al bima unzila ilayhim rabbihi wal mu'minun. You read those last two ayats, they are enough for you. How simple and how easy. Our religion is a religion where things are made easy. Yuridullahu bikum al yusr, wala yuridu bikum al usr. Allah wants ease for you people. He doesn't want to make things difficult for you people. And I have to take time out to say this very quickly to the rough and tough brothers and sisters, the mutshaddideen, the judgmental people, the nasty people, the nasty people. The ones who look down on everybody. Just always nasty. I'm on the Sunnah, you're not, I'm your, Or I'm practice. Hey man, back up and miss us with that stuff. We are living in a time right now. That's what the Nabi said. Every year, every year gets worse and worse. There's no year except the one that comes after is worse than the previous one. So the one who was a youngster in 2022 is not like the one who was a youngster in 1975. It's not the same. What I had to deal with and what these Shabab are dealing with. No, I'm not saying we're happy with everything that our Shabab are doing or not doing, but it's a tough time to be a youngster right now. It's a tough time to be unmarried right now. It's a tough time to practice Islam right now in terms of the environment so forth. So let's have a little bit more rahman and understanding on people. Because the things that I'm saying, we should do this for the evil eye. Do that, don't do this for the evil eye. 
these things many people are not doing. The one who is judgmental and looking down, he's not doing it. But he wants to come out to us and judge us like that. We say to him, no, brother, take it easy, man. Take it easy. And don't have ghuru like that. Don't be mu'jib with yourself. Three things will destroy you. And one of them is you being super and overly impressed with yourself. That's what we wanted to mention from the, from the du'as, what the Prophet used to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bismillah alladhi la yudurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil sama' wa huwa as-sami'ul alim. He used to say that when he came and he sat down in any place, any time he came and he sat down. A new majlis, this masjid, he came and sat down. He would say that du'a. Bismillah alladhi la yudurru ma'asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil sama' wa huwa as-sami'ul alim. He said anyone who says that, Nothing will bother him and nothing will harm him. Inshallah. Till he gets up, he leaves that place. So in concluding, Ikhwani, brothers, sisters, you sisters, you mothers, women are really involved with how pretty, how they look, their hair and this and that. And that's all fine and dandy. But be careful. Help your husbands. Teach your children. Make dua. Make isti'adha for the kids. Remind them. Take the little babies. Make the dua that Ibrahim made upon his sons and the Nabi upon his grandchildren. And everybody, you have a responsibility. Be of the people of the dhakirin Allah wa dhakirat. Dhakirin Allah kathira wa dhakirat. Those men and women who remember Allah a lot. And remember to make dua for people and the things that they have. In concluding, we want to remind you, brothers in Pakistan, you know, what they're going through in Pakistan, brothers are come up with a project here, trying, inshallah, to build some wells in Pakistan. We just want to remind you, brothers, of the importance of getting behind that initiative with whatever Allah has blessed you with and given you to help those people. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tuhu ilayk wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh